services to begin. We have a few announcements we'd like to make uh, to begin with. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're certainly glad to have you this evening, and we'd ask that you stick around for a few minutes so we can get to meet to greet you. We'd ask visitors and members, if you can, to fill out an attendance card that you'll find on the pew in front of you and pass those to the ends, and they'll be picked up at the end of services. We need to continue to remember Jarrah Stevens as she continues to battle with her cancer. Remember her and the family, and we have several of our members that we need to remember in our prayers. You'll find those in the news bulletin if you don't have one. Uh, they're out in the foyer. If you're a member of Mickey Sandlin's evangelism group, uh, it's your evening to meet in the library and pick up your assignments. We need to remember Norma Law. She's the sister of Emily Biggs. Uh, she passed away early this morning. No arrangements have been made yet. And we need to keep Emily in our prayers. Uh, she fell yesterday while visiting her sister in Granbury. Uh, she was checked out and she had no broken bones. Let's all remember uh, our upcoming door knocking campaign. It's set to begin July the 12th through the 19th. And if you have an interest in that or if you can help in that effort, it would certainly be appreciated. You can see Glenn Mayberry. As far as our order of services tonight, our lesson will be given to us by Ken Hope. We'll be led in our song service by Alan Stevens. Our opening prayer will be led by Jim Woodson. And Paul Hamilton will be reading our scripture. It will be found in the book of Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. And at the end of our worship, we'll be led in a closing prayer by Jim Woolley. So let's begin our services at this time. Would you bow with me? Father, we come before you at this time. We're thankful for the avenue of prayer that, that we can commune with you, lay our petitions before your feet. And Father, we have special petitions. We ask that you be with the uh, Jerry Stevens family. And we know that this is such a difficult time for them and just watch over them and care for them. And care for those that are on their way over there or from this congregation to visit with Jera, We just pray for, for safety for that group. Father, we also have Janice and Doris that are having treatments, and we just pray for those treatments to be a success for those ladies. We're also mindful of this country and the deep divisions that exist. We just hope and pray that some way can be found to unite us, and we know that the way for that is to remember those principles that you've given us to live by. Father, we hope, just hope that we can find some way to, to bring that back to the majority of this country. We're thankful for Jesus that was willing to come to this earth, die such a horrible death, to give us a hope of, of heaven and a chance to be in, in heaven with our spiritual family and with you we ask you to be with us now as we enter into this worship service forgive us when we fail you and it's through jesus that we pray amen if you would like to follow along it's going to be solomon a song song of solomon 1 15 and 16. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. 
Behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. You'll join with me in singing number 249, How Precious is the Book, 249. <clears throat> How precious is the book divine by inspiration given, bright as a lamp its precepts shine to guide my soul. Seventy-seven. I have heard of a land.
have the communion, we'll sing number 758, When This Passing World Is Done. passing world is done. When has sunk yon glaring sun? When I stand with Christ on high, looking o'er life's history, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till We'll get again together this evening to offer the, the Lord's Supper to those who are unable to partake this morning. And I would like to make one small statement in the fact that this morning I was talking with Jim about a particular scripture. It's Proverbs. Uh, and actually, I, of course, my mind would quit right this time. But it does say, that as iron sharpens iron, so does one sharpens a friend's countenance. And I think the point of that scripture is to let us know that together, working with one another, we make each other better. For when you sharpen a knife, you sharpen it in such a way. But as we work with one another and we are with one another, we sharpen each other. We make each other better in Christ. And that's the same reason we know that things in the world that don't always work right gives us the opportunity to be better for Christ, to show God what we're made of. And for that reason, we also have this Lord's Supper so that we may show our God how much we're thankful for what he did so that we may experience what we can have in the end of all things. You don't know health until you've known sickness. So in that respect, as you remember our Lord and his death upon the cross, think of all that has happened that we have done that means so much to us.
If you need the Lord's Supper this evening, would you raise your hand? And we will we'll attend. If you will bow with me. Our Lord who art in heaven, we thank thee so much for the blessings you have given us in this life. We thank you especially for thy son who died upon the cross. As his body was hung there in pain and agony, that we might be spared the agony of hell. We thank you, O Lord, for this sacrifice. We ask that you bless this bread, which represents his body, which hung upon that cross, and help us, Father, always to remember what has happened and been done on our behalf. Strengthen us always in thy word and thy will. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, we come together here again to prayer to you uh, and thanking you so much for all blessings you've given us, um, so numerous that we, can, we can't list them all, Lord, and we thank you above all for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, Lord, and at this time we focus on that cross and, uh, and the blood that was shed there and for us, for our sins, and we pray that those that take this uh, fruit of the vine, which represents that blood, that they take it in a way and manner. That's pleasing your sight, and we thank you, Lord, for all blessings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Ken's lesson will be 272, 272. I have decided to follow Jesus. Before we have the offering, we'll sing number 788, Wonderful Words of Life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Wonderful. 
Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us, and thank you for every all the blessings that you rain upon us. And just as that song says that Jesus gives to all, help us to be able to give back with a humble and cheerful heart. And in and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. commend you for being here I know that we all know that we should be here and that we don't need an earthly commendation to fulfill our responsibility to God but nevertheless if our God will compliment us for doing his will I think we can certainly commend each other for doing what we ought to do and being here tonight and looking forward to looking into his inspired word and learning more about his will for our lives, specifically tonight, learning more about his will for our marriages. Remember what we dealt with this morning. We're continuing our study tonight, Song of Solomon and Your Marriage. Uh, we mentioned several things. Let's just read through these again. This book has been neglected and misunderstood. Again, it's been the subject of very fanciful interpretation. The Jews considered this book uniquely sublime. It's also known as the Song of Songs. Thus, it's Solomon's best or most important. It is a true love song. It's a celebration of human affection. Within her pages, we see and learn the strength of enduring devotion. And the last thing we said by way of some introductory thoughts, it exalts the beauty and the intimacy of married love. We might not know everything regarding this book, The Song of Solomon, but I'll guarantee you when you read it, you understand the principle, the beauty of married love. Let me read something. This was written by Tertullian in the third century, and notice what it says. It says, Beautiful is the marriage of Christians. Two who are one in hope, one in, the way they, one in the way of life they follow, one in the religion they practice. They're both servants of the same master. Nothing divides them either in flesh or in spirit. They are two in one flesh. And where there is one flesh, there is also one spirit. They pray together, they worship together, instructing one another, strengthening one another. Side by side. They visit God's church. Side by side, they face difficulties and persecutions, share their consolations. They have no secrets from one another. They never bring sorrow to each other's hearts. Unembarrassed, they visit the sick and assist the needy. They give alms without anxiety. Psalms and hymns they sing. He, uh, hearing and seeing this, Christ rejoices. To such as these he gives his peace. Where there are two together, there also he is present. And where he is, there evil is not. You know, that's a beautiful description of marriage some 1,700 years ago. And in Song of Solomon, we find similar thoughts. We find what marriage should be like. 
Notice, we also mentioned this this morning, Solomon slays two moral Goliaths. Now we're talking, of course, in the book of Song of Solomon. These two moral Goliaths are put to death. They're laid to rest. The first, immorality, lust, the view that suggests that love and marriage is nothing more than a sensuous or erotic affair. We explained that this morning. But just remember, this is the view that many today sadly have concerning marriage. Well, the Song of Solomon, it puts this giant, this misunderstanding to rest. And also asceticism. This view denies the beauty, legitimacy, and essential goodness of the physical union between husband and wife. You know, when you look at these two extremes and then read the Bible, you'll see God's beautiful balance. It's not immorality, lust, nor is it asceticism. As you bring these thoughts close together, what you have is what the Bible teaches, that intimacy is indeed God's plan, and that it is, you know, a part of marriage. It's not the whole of marriage, but it is a very beautiful, wonderful part of marriage. And so we need to understand these truths as we maturely go to the Song of Solomon. Now, what we want to look at tonight, we're going to make four points, and we're entitling these Solomon's Joy Within Marriage. Obviously, some have lost the joy in marriage. I believe by reading the scriptures, specifically tonight, Song of Solomon, we can restore that joy that we once had in our home, in our marriage. Here's the first, the joy of companionship. This is what you'll find in the Song of Solomon, the joy of companionship. This is expressed in many, many different ways. But when you read this book, here's what you're going to see. This couple, when they are together, they are immensely happy. And when they are separated one from another, this brings sorrow. In Song of Solomon 5 and verse 16, in this context, it says, This is my beloved, and this is my friend. And so this marriage is built upon the beauty of friendship. They're friends first. This is my beloved. This is my friend. This is the one I want to be with. When we are apart from each other, this brings us sorrow. I want us to look at some verses here. And I think this is so interesting to me because you know when God sets this book, the, the timing of it, it's set in the springtime. And again, this is when love is in full bloom. And so look at this as we think about this companionship, as we think about the Song of Solomon, as we focus our attention upon marriage, God sets this book during the springtime. Look at Song of Solomon, the second chapter. Read with me, if you will, verses 10 through 13. 10 through 13, Song of Solomon 2. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear upon the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs, and the vines with her tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Well, that's what they want to do, one with another. But this is the springtime. In fact, when you look at Song of Solomon 2 and verse 5, and this will later be said in Song of Solomon 5 and verse 8, they are lovesick. They are lovesick. They love each other. And so, once again, remember that. Now, this, this companionship, as we look at and as we look for this companionship, remember this, God made us to be social creatures. That's why in Genesis 2 and verse 18, after God says seven times in chapter 1, it is good, the first time in chapter 2 you read that something's not good, it's man's state of aloneness. It's not good for man to be alone. 
God intends for us to be social creatures. His beloved son, when Jesus came, you know, in Luke, the second chapter, verse 52, we really don't have much about the life of Jesus between about the ages 12 and 30. Uh, we don't know, but, but we have one verse that sort of fills out everything we need to know. During the ages of 12 and 30, Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God, and in favor with man. Notice that. He increased socially. He was a social creature. You remember Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9? Two are better than one, for they have good return for their labor. And so when you look throughout the Bible, you see this, the joy of companionship. That's the way God planned it. It's not good for man to be alone. And again, the Shulamite in Song of Solomon and the beloved, the husband, the wife, they would agree with that. It's not good to be alone. It is good to be with the one that you love. Look at a few verses here. I want you to take your Bibles. Follow with me as we read just a few of these. Look at chapter 1 and verse 4. This seems to be the emphasis throughout the book. Draw me away. Draw me away. This is the Shulamite's desire. She wants to be with him. Draw me away. Look also at chapter 2 and verse 13. Remember at the end of this verse we just read? Look, it says, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And so draw me away. Come away with me. Look at the next verse in chapter 7 and verse 11. Notice what this says. Chapter 7 and verse 11, Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the fields. Let us lodge in the villages. And so draw me away. Come, my beloved. They want to be together. That is their desire, one for the other. And this, again, is quite wonderful because when you go to chapter 3, look with me at chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 4, but... First, let's emphasize verse, verse 1 of chapter 3. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. Stop here. By night on my bed. This is a dream sequence. This is her dreaming about him. And you know what her dream is about? Again, she wants to be with him. That's what she desires. The joy of companionship. You see it in the Song of Solomon. This is the way it ought to be. And so again, read verse 1 through verse 4 with me of chapter 3. By night on my bed I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will rise now, I said, and go about the city in the streets and in the, in the squares. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me. I said, have you seen the one I love? Scarcely had I passed by them. When I found the one I love, I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him to the house of my mother and into the chamber of her who conceived me. So, so here's the dream sequence. She wants to be with him. She wants to see him. And in her dream, it's finally realized. She finds him. Look also later on in the book in chapter 5. Look at chapter 5. Read with me verses 3 through 6. The same thing is happening here. This, once again, is a dream sequence. What's it emphasizing? Companionship, togetherness. Even when she's asleep, she desires to be with him. Look what it says in verse 2. Verse 2, let's go chapter 5 verse 2 through verse 6 it says I sleep but my heart is awake now stop here is there a better definition that anyone here can come up with regarding a dream I sleep but my heart is awake I sleep but my mind is still going my body's asleep but my mind is thinking that's a dream and so that's what she says I sleep but my heart is awake 
It is a voice of my beloved. He knocks saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the, of the night. I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? That's her response. And then look what it says. My beloved put his hand by the, door of the, by the latch of the door and my heart yearned for him. I arose to open for my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. You ever had a dream and, and what you're dreaming about is not realized, it's not fulfilled? Well, that's what she's saying. I was dreaming about him. I thought he was there, and, and then I couldn't find him. But this underscores what we're saying. Song of Solomon, the joy within marriage that this book is presenting. This joy is the joy of companionship. It's the joy of togetherness. These two want more than anything to spend some time with each other. Look at this second point. The joy of love expressed by word and deed. You know, I'm sure if we were a fly on the wall in some houses, what we would hear wouldn't, wouldn't be what you hear in the Song of Solomon. These two are complimenting each other. These two, again, they love each other, and that love is expressed by word and deed. We're not going to emphasize so much the deeds right now, but, but this love expressed by words, this is where it begins. You know, in 1 John 3 and verse 18, John tells us not to love with word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now, when he says, do not love with word or tongue, the point is not that we shouldn't love with word, that we shouldn't love with tongue. The point is not don't ever tell each other you love each other. The point is don't only love like that. Don't love simply with word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. Oh, yes, tell each other you love each other, but demonstrate that. Don't let your, quote, love stop there. I love you and then we demonstrate something just the opposite. You remember Delilah asked Samson, how can you say you love me when your heart is far from me? In, us, in essence, she said, don't give me that. Don't tell me how much you care about me when your deeds do not demonstrate it. But when you look at the Song of Solomon, you'll hear something that we need to hear more in our home. And that is the husband complimenting his wife. The wife complimenting her husband. Look at some of this with me. One of the first things we'll do, look what the man says. Now men, pay attention to this. You know, this is, this is compliments 101 for us. Um, look what it says. The man in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, this is what the husband says, the beloved says. He says, if you do not know, O fairest among women. Now notice that. O fairest among women. Among all the women, he says, you are the fairest. He says, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats uh, beside the shepherd's tents. I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Now, I know even to the wives, this doesn't sound real romantic, does it? I've compared you to my filly among the Pharaoh's chariots. In this day, this was a wonderful compliment. Men, you've got to change the words. Don't, don't compare her to some horse or she's going to think you're calling her a nag, okay? But, but the principle, he is complimenting her. Look also at another context. Chapter 1 and verse 15, notice he says, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. This is what Paul read for our scripture reading. 
you have dove's eyes. Now, I've often thought if you're a dove hunter, this might not be the best thing to tell your wife, okay? But again, in this context, in this setting, this is a wonderful, a, a glorious compliment. You have dove's eyes. Look also, chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, Like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. And so once again, she's the fairest among women. She is like the flower among thorns. Look at something else, he says. In chapter 4 and verse 7, chapter 4 and verse 7, You are all fair, my love and there is no spot in you. And so his point is you are perfect. There is no spot, there, there's no blemish in you. This is what he sees when he sees her. And again, look at her. When she speaks, she speaks by way of complimenting him. And, and let me point this out. You know, the Bible gives us an immutable principle. You reap what you sow. And in a home where compliments are exchanged, it's not uncommon, it's not unnatural to, to hear compliments. You give a compliment, you hear a compliment. You know, if you sow something else, mean, vicious words, don't be surprised if that's not what you reap. But when you sow compliments, when you sow kindness, don't be surprised if it's not the compliments, the kindness that you receive in return. You're not doing it for that. But again, this is the home as God would have it. They exchange these compliments. And so listen to what she says. In chapter 1 and verse 16, notice this. Chapter 1 and verse 16, she says, right after he's told her, she is fair, my love, uh, behold, you are fair, you have dove's eyes, verse 15. Right after that, notice, behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant, also our bed is green. And so she responds. She responds, you are handsome. Look also, chapter 5, verses 10 and following. I won't read all of this, but, but look how verse 10, look how it begins. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. You remember what he told her? You're the fairest among women. She's saying you're the best. You, you take 10,000 and you, you're the best among 10,000. And then as you continue to read in verses 11 and following, she's going to mention 10 things. 10 things about this one, her husband, and look what she concludes in verse 16. She says, his mouth is most sweet. Yes, he's altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. He is altogether lovely. And so the compliments are exchanged. This is part of the joy of married love. Again, the joy of companionship. Again, the joy of love expressed by word and by deed. I know I've told this before, but I like this story. It's a story about a husband and wife, and they've gotten into that rut of just, just being pretty mean to each other. Not complimenting each other, but, but looking for the spots, you know, looking for what they can say by way of little digs to each other. And so, you know, the preacher called him in, and he said, you know, this is going to have to stop. Y'all need to be treating each other better than this. And, and so he, he took him to the Song of Solomon. And after talking to him, he said, here's what I want us to do. I want us to meet again. But he said, in between now and when we meet again, I want you both to read the Song of Solomon. And he told the wife, I want you to look. I want you to look in the book of Song of Solomon and find a compliment that you can give your husband. He said, there are many of them. Just pick one. He turned to the husband. He said, you've got the same assignment. There are a lot of compliments in the Song of Solomon that you can put forth for your wife. And he said, I want you to find it. So they met together the next session. And he could tell pretty quickly nothing had changed. They're still both grouchy. They're grumpy. They can't, you know, even look at each other without a snarl. And, and so he said, did you do your assignment? They both said, yes. Yes, we did. 
And he said, okay. He said, well, he asked her, he said, do you want to begin? I, did you find a compliment in the book of Song of Solomon? She said, yes. He said, well, will you please tell your husband that compliment? Well, she barked out. It's in chapter 7 and verse 2. And your belly is like a heap of wheat. Well, the, the guy's taken back a little bit. And he said, well, uh, to the husband, he said, did you look through the Song of Solomon? Yes, I did. Did you find a compliment for your wife? Yes. It's in chapter 7 also. It's chapter 7 and verse 4. And your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which faces towards Damascus. Well, you don't go to the book of Solomon for this, okay? Again, but, but in the home, in the home as God would have it, there's kindness. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Remember the words of Ephesians 4 and verse 32? And so these two things, the joy of companionship, the joy of love expressed by word and deed, the joy of a deep, mutual, and abiding trust and commitment. You see that in the Song of Solomon. You remember in Proverbs 31, verses 10 and following, a virtuous wife who can find her worth is far above rubies. Well, verse 11 says, The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. There is that devotion which brings about that deep-seated trust. And this should go both ways. The heart of the wife should be able to safely trust in her husband. It's one of the tragedies of life when the wife or the husband does trust in the other and that trust is broken. That trust is shattered. That's sad. But that doesn't happen in the book of Proverbs. It doesn't happen here in Song of Solomon. There is this deep, and mutual and abiding trust and commitment. Really, as I've said, this trust is going to bring about this commitment. I trust him. I trust her. I am committed to her. You know, in Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, flee the love of money, being content with such that you have. For the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's that kind of commitment we're talking about. It's a trust in which when you trust, it's safely placed in them. And it's a commitment that says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That's what we're seeing in the Song of Solomon. <laughs> These two, again, they want to be together. They're heartbroken when they are apart. They complement each other when they are together. And they trust each other. There is this commitment one to the other. Look at a few verses that suggest this, this commitment. Look at chapter 2, chapter 2 and verse 16. This is what she says. But again, as you read the book, I'll guarantee you he is thinking would say the same thing. Look at chapter 2 and verse 16. My beloved is mine and I am his. Notice that. My beloved is mine. I know that. He's mine and I'm his. That commitment. Look also, if you will, chapter 6 and verse 3. This same principle is echoed again. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Notice the confidence there. Notice the trust. I am my beloved. I belong to him and he belongs to me. There's still another verse when you talk about this trust, this commitment. Look at chapter 7. Look at verse 10. Same thing we've been reading together. I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. Remember what we said this morning? Genesis 3 and verse 16, 
your desire shall be for your husband, God speaking to Eve. And remember Ezekiel 24 and verse 16, the desire of Ezekiel's eyes was his wife. And so they have this desire for each other. I am my beloved's. And again, they desire one another. Commitment, trust. Look at chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 10. This is one of the times that the beloved, the husband, the man, states this same principle. He says, How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse. How much better than wine is your love and the scent of your perfumes than all spices. Again, your love is better. It's better than anything I could conceive of. Trust, commitment, you find it in Song of Solomon. You don't find it in our society too many times. And why is that? Because we're not reading God's word. We're not listening to his instruction, inspired instruction. We're, we're doing our own thing in marriage, and you see where it gets us. There's a way which seems right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. We'll look at something else. This last point tonight, the joy of intimacy shared. Remember what we talked about, Song of Solomon? It, it slays two moral Goliaths. It puts to death immorality and lust. It puts to death asceticism because what it shows is the joy of intimacy shared. Look, if you will, read Song of Solomon. Look at chapter 1. Chapter 1 and verse 2, look at the first part of this. It says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Well, they're affectionate one to another. And they're not ashamed of that affection. They talk about kissing one another. Again, look at another passage. In chapter 2 and verse 6, notice what this says. And you'll see this again later on in chapter 8 and verse 3. But notice what she says, chapter 2 and verse 6. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. And so they don't mind embracing. The hugs and the kisses, it's part of their married life and should be. Again, they're sharing everything in life. They share the intimacy that God has placed within marriage. Look at this, if you will. This, this is what he says. This is concerning him. Look at chapter 4 and verse 9. Chapter 4 and verse 9. It says, You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one look, uh, link of your necklace. The point is, when probably when he's looking and his eyes capture hers, just that look in her eyes, it ravishes his heart. He, he desires her. He loves her with that kind of depth of love. And so, again, his heart is ravished. Look at chapter 7 and verse 10. I know we, we read this, but again, look at this. It says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Now again, this is the wife speaking concerning her husband. Notice the confidence with which she speaks. His desire is for me. She's not thinking his desire is for this one at work. His desire is for this one over here. No, his desire is for me. Again, the joy of intimacy shared. And look at a couple more verses. Notice concerning her now, we read this. This is part of the dream sequence. But remember what it says in chapter 5 and verse 4. She's dreaming. She thinks her beloved is, is at the door. And, but look what happens. It says, my beloved puts his hand uh, by the latch of the door, and my heart yearns for him. So his desire is for her. Her heart is yearning for him. That's normal. That's natural. That's what makes a healthy and holy marriage, the intimacy shared. 
In chapter 2 and verse 4, notice what she says here. In chapter 2 and verse 4, he brought me into the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. His banner over me was love. And so this is what we see in Song of Solomon. It really is a tribute to married love. And we see the maturity that marriage demands. You know, sometimes I wonder because, and I'm not talking about just young people. There have been older people who have gotten married and they're not mature enough to enter God's institution. They're selfish, they're, they're mean, spirited. They don't have the depth of maturity. Marriage calls for maturity, a profound maturity that will lead to a profound commitment, a commitment that will keep that couple together through life. You remember again what Adam said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken from man. And for this cause, he's talking about the cause he's mentioning there is marriage. And for this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That demands maturity. Again, this is truly a beautiful book, one that is neglected, one that is misunderstood, but one, as we look at the home, remember what we said this morning? I believe with all my being that Song of Solomon is an amplification of what Solomon says in Proverbs 5 and verse 18. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Be always exhilarated in her love. Solomon, how do I do that? Read my next book. Read the Song of Solomon. You'll see how to rejoice with the wife of your youth. You will see how to always be exhilarated in her love. One of the tenderest verses is near the end. When love has been tried and love is triumphant, many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. Again, Song of Solomon 8 and verse 7. Troubles cannot overwhelm your marriage. Not if it's built upon that solid foundation. Problems are not going to destroy your home. Not if each family member is what they ought to be. Many waters cannot quench love. Again, many rivers will not overflow it. Nothing that Satan throws at you, your home, your marriage, is going to impact it. Not if you're the kind of man, the kind of lady that you ought to be. You remember when the Holy Spirit spoke to the home? In Colossians 3, verses 18 through 21. It's so interesting because he, he chooses one thing to say to each family member because every family member contributes to the joy that we're talking about here in the home. But it's all summed up in nine words. It's really so easy. It's really so simple. We complicate marriage. We complicate the home. We complicate joy because we're selfish at times. We're thinking about ourselves. We're not doing what the Bible teaches and thinking about others. And so when you go to Colossians 3, verses 18 through 21, here's how simple it is. Wives submit. Husbands love. Children obey. Fathers provoke not. He chooses the most important and likewise the most difficult duty for each family member. And he says, here's what you need to do. Wives, you submit to your husband. Husbands, you love your wives. Children, you obey your parents in all things for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And fathers, really parents, wives, mothers are included there. Provoke not. Don't exasperate your child. You do everything to promote that obedience that was just talked about the verse preceding, Colossians 3 and verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things. And now, parents, you do everything 
to bring about that obedience. Don't provoke them to wrath, lest they be exasperated, discouraged. Many waters cannot quench love. Now, for what we should be in our homes, our homes are going to be brighter. Our homes are going to be better. Our homes are going to be stronger. Our homes are going to glorify God who allows us to step into his institution of marriage. And our homes are going to be a blessing to others who, who see two and more, the family, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You remember, that's what Paul said to his brethren in Philippi. I know that's a congregational setting, but, but for the home, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Psalm 34 and verse 3, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. There's that togetherness. There's that companionship in the deepest thing that life has to offer, glorifying God. Let's do this, they say, together. Tonight, I don't know where you are spiritually. I don't know the condition of your home. I don't know the condition of your marriage, but you do. You do, and God certainly does. Even if you might be deceiving yourselves, let me tell you, God knows it's like the Laodiceans. They said, we're rich, we're wealthy, we're in need of nothing. Well, the Lord said, you don't even know. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Let's examine ourselves. Let's examine our families, our homes, our marriage. Let's be honest. Let's be objective. Let's make sure we're doing heaven's will because if and when we do, the result of that is going to be happiness, an unbridled happiness. You remember I mentioned earlier in our lesson, Proverbs 14 and verse 12, there's a way which seems right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Oh, we think this way is right, and we're going to follow this way because I think it's right. And, and it doesn't lead to joy. It doesn't lead to happiness. It leads to death. But in Psalm 19 and verse 8, it says there, the way of the Lord is right. Now stop here for a moment. There's a way which seems right unto man. That's what Solomon says. But David says in the book of Psalms, there's a way that is right. There's a way that is right, and it brings rejoicing to the heart. When we follow God's way, it's right. It's right. His way is blameless. His way is perfect. Psalm 18 and verse 30. And when we follow it, the result is joy and happiness in the home, in your marriage, in your own life. Why would we substitute that joy for the pleasures of sin? Why would we forfeit that joy? Simply because we're selfish and we're foolish and we're ignorant of God's word. Let's study. We, we, as I've said, it's God's institution. We're blessed to be a part of it. Let's see what the architect of marriage has to say for me, my responsibilities and for you, your responsibilities. And let's fulfill those responsibilities. And let's reap the joy that God fully intends to take place within our homes. Tonight, if you have a spiritual need, what better time to make that known? Your brothers and sisters, they, they care about you. They love you. Obviously, your heavenly Father does. He's willing to forgive you for any trespass that you'll repent of. If you need to come and express your needs spiritually, let us pray for you. Let's, let's do that tonight. But let's all commit at this time. Even the strongest of marriages represented here tonight. Let's all commit to do better in our homes. To bring more joy, not simply to ourselves, but for the other person. And again, our homes will be what they should be. If you need to come, won't you, while we stand together as we sing.